Hello and you're very welcome to another edition of the JMAC Podcast. I'm John Mann and of course this podcast is sponsored by orgoretro.com. Check the website out for all your retro gear needs and wants. And today I'm joined by former Armagh footballer Stevie McDonald. And it's like anything else, a man that needs very little introduction, but sure, I'll do it anyway. Um, Stevie has tagged on over the years, seven Ulster titles, one All-Ireland, three All-Stars, six Irish News All-Stars. Uh, represented Ireland in the international rules three times, has won uh, Armagh intermediate title and uh, captain Ireland in 2010 in all um, international rules series. So, Steve, where did it all go wrong from there? <laughs> Six times, not three. <laughs> <laughs> um, good stuff. And so, how are you keeping, Stephen? You're keeping good? Not too bad, yeah. Just glad to be back um, out in the football fields to, uh, as of from last week. So it's been a long enough wait for us. I know, I know the guys uh, down south they're still waiting for that um, opportunity to get on the fields, and hopefully that comes soon. But um, thankfully, um, uh, up north where we've been afforded that chance to get back and, and train again. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it, it just is great, and obviously there's not much roadmap for the clubs up here unfortunately at the minute and I suppose how, how, how did you find it last week obviously are you uh, you're managing a team at the minute are you? I'm managing a team up in Thurong and managing Clano so I am right. so second year um, with the boys and you know um, two quite difficult starts uh, two, two difficult years last year obviously we got back the pre-season and all was going well and then you're hit with the pandemic and um, it's it's um, everything's closed down there for maybe four or five months and then you're going back and you're you're trying to get the know the guys all over again and the season's a short season but listen and um, there in my opinion there was progress made last year and I'm back in this year now albeit um a late pre-season but not a bad time of year to be doing pre-season training and um, with the bright evenings on the firmer ground so i think um for that reason i think the players will enjoy it a wee bit more yeah, definitely, without a doubt. And I suppose, uh, how have you found all this COVID crack the last year, Stevie? Um, it's 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 very different, and uh, it's probably affected people for the good, the bad, and the worst. But how have you found it? You're all yourself. Yeah, listen, it's it's been difficult for everyone. Um, you know, everyone in the country has been affected in sh- some shape or form. But um, unfortunately, over the last couple of months, I lost an anti through marriage uh, because of it. Um, over the Christmas and New Year break um, myself and the rest of my family um, contracted the virus and, and I was hit pretty bad with it believe it or not and um, I, so I know how 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 much of an impact it can have on, on certain individuals and um, you know when you think you're young and fit and, and healthy and well I still see myself as young anyway but you think you're fit and healthy and, and doing the right things and then something like that there hits you and knocks you for six and um, it really sets you back so um, regardless of of how fit people are, you know, um, this can really set you back and and can create havoc in your lifestyle. And um, it do, it done that for me for a month or two. And thankfully, I'm all back to normal now. Back working out and and, and doing my, my thing and and trying to be as as clean and as healthy again as possible. Yeah, definitely, no doubt. And okay, like obviously, with yourself being sick and kind of contracting the virus, and I suppose has it changed your perspective on a lot of stuff this COVID and like you know your mindset and a lot of things, Stevie? Yeah, well, listen. Um, I suppose the the biggest thing is, um, you know, it's very important to spend spend time with your family, spend spend valuable time with your family, and, and enjoy every opportunity that you have. Uh, with them, you know, um, my own mother at the minute is suffering from dementia, Alzheimer's. It's quite difficult to see her and, and to see what she's going through and um, thankfully um, she hasn't contracted the virus because I, I actually believe that if, if she did contract it, that it, it would almost wipe her out um, given the, the situation that she's in at the minute. So um, you, you just have to, you have to keep everything close to home and, and realise what's really important here. You know, a lot of people think um, other things are important, but when, when you're hit with something like this, a pandemic like this, it really hits home that um, those that are closest to you uh, is, is time well spent all the time. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And just hope everyone can keep above board and safe and well, as they say. And I suppose, Steve, we can touch on the football end of things, the stuff we know about. And uh, Steve McDonald uh, started the ball rolling uh, with Armagh in 1999. And I suppose, it's like anything else, as I always say to the former players, you broke on to a seriously strong, impressive Armagh team. Stevie, what was it like to get the ball rolling with them? 
Yeah, well, listen, I always say I, I was one of the very, very lucky ones when, when I come on the scene with Armagh. You know, there was many great Armagh footballers um, played for over a decade before me and didn't taste any success. And, and people like Neil Smith and Martin McQuillan, who were excellent footballers in their own right um, and represented Armagh for maybe 13, 14 years, they, they literally just retired before I came in, uh, maybe a month or two before I came in to the setup, and they never won an Ulster title, they never really achieved much. Uh, they went to a National League final in 1994, but that was really the highlight of their, in their, in their county careers. And within six months, I was part of a, a team that won Ulster for the first time in 17 years. So, uh, listen, the, the time is everything, I suppose, what, that's what they say. And I came into a team that was... Um, very, very competitive, very hungry for success and knocking on the door and, and waiting for that opportunity to, to get across the line. And um, listen, while they didn't play a part um, in terms of the playing aspect of, of things in 1989, uh, I was a sub. Um, it gave me a good insight into you know how to develop on myself as a footballer and how to break into the starting 15 and, and only for that opportunity in those um, seven or eight months in 1989 being involved with the, the squad um, I don't think I would have broken in just as soon as what I did. Yeah, definitely without doubt. And I suppose we can we can touch on that uh, glorious day in 2002, the All Ireland final against Kerry and um, just a terrific, terrific Armagh team that you were a part of and the, the likes of uh, Kieran McGeaney and McNulty's and just so, so, so strong, Steve. And I suppose when you're playing with players like that and to kind of get to the Holy Grail and Kieran McGinney just the peak of his powers, leading us through all the, leading us through the trenches and just a, a remarkable, remarkable years for your, year for yourself, Steve. And uh, not bad to win an All-Ireland three years into your Armagh career. No, definitely not. Um, but that Armagh team had been knocking on the door, as I said, you know, and we lost a couple of All-Ireland semi-finals. So, you know, we probably used the heartache of those All Ireland semi finals and then the impact of Joe Kernan coming in and refreshing things on the management point of view and, and having his own ideas definitely sparked a wee bit of life back into us and gave us the belief as players. We knew we weren't a million miles away. We had been beat by by Galway, Meath and Kerry the previous three years when all the three teams kicked on and won the All Ireland. So um, you know, all it would have taken was a tweak here or there to to really get us across the, the finishing line and Possibly um, Joe coming in made a massive improvement, but um, Joe having the foresight to put in the likes of Ronan Clark into the starting team um, paid dividends and, and was a masterstroke. And, um, you know, it was the impact that such a young player had on, on, on that team at that time um, created a massive, massive influence. Yeah, definitely, without doubt. And so, say, tell me about some of them characters as well, the likes of Geese or Ronan Clark, Bushy McConville. And, like I always say to the former players, you're only going to improve your game yourself the way you go on on the pitch, even off the pitch, by playing with lads like that, Stevie. Yeah, listen, you, you mentioned the word character there, and that team had any amount of characters. We had, you know, we had our own field leader in, in Kieran McGinney and Paul McGrain as his deputy, and but you know, we had multiple players who could have captained that team. We had the McIntyres who were outstanding leaders in their own right. We had the McDoldys who drove the team forward at every opportunity. Ashton McConville you know, an all Ireland club winning captain. We had many, many players um, that, you know, stood up and um, were counted on, and were leaders in their own right. And um, when you had that many players that um, had that impact on the team, you know, it created a, an environment in training where it was so intense and so, um, I suppose, competitive that, you know, we always felt that whatever we'd done the training field, it was going to I do what we were facing in, on a Sunday in the in the championship match, and you know having Andy McNulty hanging off you and and tearing rips of you um, in a in a training match definitely um, stood me stood to me in terms of of what I was uh, expecting to get on the on the Sunday in the, in the championship match because the reality is Andy McNulty back then was for me the outstanding man to man marker, and if I was getting it from him week in week out, then I could cope with any cornerback hanging off me in a championship game. Yeah, definitely. And I suppose we did reference the fact that Kerry in an All Ireland final, Stevie. Um, you know, it's 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 as big as they get. So that kind of day, obviously, you're quite uh, quite young at the time, and still, and obviously, three years into your Armagh career. So coming up against the best Kerry, one of the greatest teams of all time, as well. So what was that day like itself, uh, Stevie? And uh, probably probably one of the best days of your life. Yeah, um, you know, when you think back, you always try to 
remember wee pockets and snippets of of um, what the day was about and but for me it was a collection of things it was the whole year it was the whole collective of that year that really um finished off with that particular day um but you know trying to think back to to the other final day itself you know i think the fact that we had beat dublin in, in the semi-final give us a massive massive boost of confidence and um, dublin had been on the serious crest of wave you know the first time in seven years that they won a Leinster title um you know the whole hill 16 army were were right behind the team once again and they really felt that they were going to kick on and compete in the all Ireland final and for us to get over the line the semi-final was a massive massive stepping stone and you know i always be asked um what was the most important game or the biggest game you've ever played in. and for me it was definitely the semi-final so it was um, when you play in front of a packed house in Crook Park it's always a special day when you play in front of the dubs in a packed house in Crook Park makes it that bit more spectacular and I have huge admiration and huge respect for what Dublin have achieved and I always loved playing against them as well because um, of the I suppose the carnival atmosphere that they bring to the occasion but the one thing that stands out in my mind, when we were leaving Crook Park after beating Dublin in the semi-final, their there's, there's supporters and fans lined the streets of, of Dublin and applauded us as we as we drove through. And that was a special feeling, so it was. And, you know, when you see that and experience that from your rival fans, you know, really gives you an uplifting spirit. But going on to the all Ireland final, you know, there was lots of things that were said and done. And the one thing that I remember was obviously the morning of the All Ireland final having the wee letter sent through the, the um, I suppose, the, the underneath the door of uh, from Muhammad Ali wishing us the best of luck. And that was a massive um, surprise for us because we would have picked out, you know, any wee um, pockets of information and, and inspirational quotes uh, throughout the campaign. And um, we, we certainly used Muhammad Ali's quotes and video um, montages along the way and it was it was a nice moment to get that uh, the morning of the all Ireland final and it, it it hit home that we are about to go into something special here. Yeah, definitely without a doubt. And so it's like what like we can touch on it to later years, but what was it about like this group of players? Because everyone can always remember like the RMAS teams, like can we always keep reps and keys and penalty yourself, McCall and Ron Clark, Aaron Kern, like there's so many kind of good players that always stand in people's minds. Like, what was it about that group that made you so special, Stevie? It was their will to win, their drive, and um, you know, when you when you think back, then it was probably that Armad team that got GA to the levels that they're at now in terms of of their professionalism and. Their, uh, I suppose, their ability to plan things ahead and, and in advance. And you, you asked me earlier on, you know, what was it like to go out and play in the All Ireland final? And um, we had re uh, rehearsed that weeks and weeks in advance. Um, you know, from after we beat Dublin, you know, Joe Kiernan had us up around the city west, and uh, going in minute detail from minute to minute what was going to happen from hitting the field going through the parade, being on the field that wee bit extra longer than what you would be in normal circumstances. Um, everything, you know, that we expected to happen did happen. And that was simply because of the rehearsals that we went through as a team and the the the, de the attention, the detail that the management went through. So we expected exactly what was going to happen. and. So that was already played out in our mind. But that Armad team, we would have done anything. So we would have to, to really taste success. Um, you know, behind the scenes, you, you know, um, obviously players were doing their own specialist training. But, you know, each and every player in that team, you know, just had huge drive and ambition to be successful and to do the best for Armad and to be the most successful Armad team of all time. And um, thankfully, we managed to succeed in that regard. But... Um, there was just a serious hunger and a serious appetite to win. That, that's that's really all I can say. You know, there's many, many games where we didn't play at our best and we were far from our best, but we always knew how to win games. And, you know, in the final moments of, of a game, it might have been one kick pass into a full forward line and the likes of a German margin coming off the shoulder and kicking a, a vital score that got us across the line. And, you know, um, it was just, we had a serious, serious belief in our own ability um, that no team 
regardless of who it was, whether it was Kerry, Dublin, Tyrone, Galway, it didn't make a difference. No team were going to beat us. And yes, there were teams that did beat us, but were very, very lucky to beat us on, on occasions. But um, we had a serious belief in our ability as a team that, you know, we were the best out there um, at that particular time. And, um, you know, we were knocking on the door with Throne and Kerry. The three teams were head and shoulders above anyone else. So, um, you know, when we played Throne and Kerry, there was never, never too much between the two team, the three teams. And, um, you know, we just had that belief instilled in us simply because we had knocked on the door for so long. Yeah, and like obviously that rivalry against Tyrone, um, Stevie hot and spicy. Um, he's always came up against the other. I can always remember the game, South and Tree. Obviously, the infamous uh, Blanc Connor Gorman you had in yourself, just iconic moments and everything that went with it. How special of a rivalry was this with Tyrone over the years, Stevie? Yeah, listen, it's only really now when you think back about it and you really respect the the impact that Tyrone and Arma had on each other and had on the rest of the country. Um. I don't think an Ulster final has been from Clonus or from anywhere other pitch um, to another province, to Crook Park since um, that rivalry. And, you know, while there was three Ulster finals in a row um, played out in Crook Park from 2004 to 2006, my, my belief was that, you know, Throne and Armagh were on separate sides of the draw. So they were, they were hoping that maybe Throne and Armagh would, would end up meeting each other in the final. Uh, as luck had it, you know, it was only one of the finals that we ended up playing each other. We played Donegal in the other two, which was 2004 and 2006. But, um, you know, there was ab absolutely at that time uh, an unbelievable rivalry between ourselves and Throne. Throne will say that we brought them to new levels. We believe that they brought us to new levels. And we, and we, and we you know, we bounced off one another. You know, you think of uh, Barcelona and Real Madrid over the last... 10 to 15 years, they bounced off one another. We certainly done that when we were playing against Throne as well. And um, yes, there was a hatred between both camps at the time. There was a bitterness and we brought that into the field. And, and that hatred and bitterness boiled over into com competitive action and, and really tight games. And, and listen, when you go to Crook Park to play in an Ulster final and you witness people from Kerry and from Cork and Waterford and Galway going to to watch these games. It shows that um, you know there was an interest in our man thrown at that time. Yeah, absolutely. And it was what was it like like with the throne that's coming up against them. Like and obviously like you had the likes of Owen Mulligan and uh, Sean Cavan and all them gents at the time. But like in probably the last couple of years, maybe that rivalry is maybe not as intense. But, like do you feel like why has it kind of gone that way? Like Tyrone just gone stride from stride to stride, or like maybe have 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 Armagh's grip and that rivalry kind of loosened in the last couple of years, Stevie? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know that rivalry was there at the time because Armagh and Tyrone were in the top three teams in the country. We knew that we were competing for all irons, so we did. And with that, there comes um, I suppose the intensity of playing high high octane championship games. Um. In recent years, particularly in the last decade, Throne have certainly uh, catapulted catapult themselves uh, way ahead of Arma in regards of um, you know competing at the highest level. You know we have recently got to an All Ireland final again over the last three years, and um, they've competed in All Ireland semi finals, they've won Ulster titles, and Arma haven't got to those levels since two thousand and eight. So it's it's somewhere where Arma need to get to. You know Arma have. Um, a team that is capable of getting to higher levels than what they're at, um, but they need to find that edge amongst themselves to to bring out the best themselves. And um, maybe it's coming up against the likes of Throne and the likes of Donegal again in Division One football that we might we might see that edge again coming out in Arma. And um, that's that's where it all stems from, you know. Teams like Donegal, Throne, Monaghan, um, who have been competitive on a national stage over the last 10 years, have regularly played Division One football as well. And when you're playing against the better teams, you develop and you mature as a team yourself. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. And obviously, we referenced the seven Ulster titles at the start as well. Stevie, seriously impressive feat. And, you know, like the Ulster Championship was always very competitive over the years. Still is, Stevie. So, seven Ulster titles, you're, you're obviously proud of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, seven Ulster titles and being involved in seven finals in ten years. So you know, having looked back, looking back on my career, you know, knowing that 
um, in all of the Ulster finals that I played in, I never lost any. Um, we drew a couple, but went back in the replay and won them. Um, you know, is is a great achievement, um, and it's something um, that you have to look back on with um, immense, you know, proudness. I suppose as well. You have to think that, you know, back then Donegal were a very very good team as well. They were very competitive. They just couldn't seem to get across the lane when they were playing against Armagh, but they could always be down. Um, down had a couple of decent seasons as well. Derry were decent back then too. So the the Ulster Championship back then was very, very competitive um, championship, uh, and it still is a very competitive championship, but they, they come out um, over the course of 10 years and to win seven and throw them in three um, just shows that both of them teams were still a, a step above the rest of the province, even though on any given day we could have been beat. Monon had beat us during that um, decade. Um, Tyrone had been beaten by Donegal as I said they'd been beaten I think maybe by Down in one or two games so you know there was a wee edge to the Ulster Championship always and every team playing each other always believed that they could get one uh, uh, over on the other team so um, that was one thing that we always faced into when we were playing any team in Ulster that you had to be on your A game um, even though sometimes you, you weren't on your A game you always had to be mentally uh, and physically ready for the battle because that's all it ever was yeah, definitely. I suppose how special of a competition is the Ulster Championship as well, Stevie, because obviously, you know, the league's the league, but when it comes to Pipe Not Dane, Clonus, Grefty Park, you know, the Delic Grounds anywhere at all, Stevie, it's it's a magical competition. Absolutely. Um, you know, what I loved about playing in the Ulster Championship back then was the you know, we've seen a lot of the flags and and being paraded around the, the stadiums and the stands back then. We, we don't see as many flags nowadays, and it's something that I'd love to see brought back into occasions, you know, getting the flags back out and waving them, and the air horns, special occasions, you know, fans make a lot of noise, and, and they really do act as the 16th man on, on when, when you're out in the field playing. And it's occasions they got there that make the Ulster Championship really special, and, and going up the streets in, in Clonus and seeing the crowds building up, is a really special feeling for any team uh, travelling through on the bus. And you know, the one thing that you always say when you're inside the bus is, you know, wouldn't you love to be out there, you know, enjoying yourself, being nice and relaxed and heading to a game to watch. But, you know, in reality and particularly in the last ten years since I've retired from the intercounty game, you always think from the outside looking in, wouldn't you love to be in there? And, you know, as a player, you have to, you know, you have to embrace your county career. You have to embrace your football career and and take it all in. And um, you know, I suppose enjoy every particular moment of it because it's over in a flash. And you know, moments like that there and playing in Ulster Championship games is you know opportunities that don't come around to everyone and opportunities that should be um, enjoyed by all. Yeah, definitely. Right. And I suppose how good preparation is the old championship because you're after kind of losing. You you played the likes of Down or Selves, Mon and everyone over the years. So how good a preparation was that for the All Ireland series, Stevie? Because at the end of the day, Ulster, Ulster, it's all very competitive, and you're probably playing similar standard teams in the All Ireland All Ireland quarterfinals, semi-finals, and maybe even finals, Stevie. Yeah, listen. Um, from from my point of view and from the position that I played on in, in the full forward line for Armagh, I always felt that um, some of the, the tightest markers that I faced were, were playing in Ulster. You know, they were playing for Monon, they were playing for Cavan, they were playing for Throne and Donegal. And those boys that um, were, were marking me week in, week out were as good, if not better, than the boys that uh, were going to be marking me, you know, when we got to maybe an All Ireland quarter final stage or an All Ireland semi final stage. <laughs> and the difference for me was there was a real tightness to the marking in terms of the guys from Ulster in comparison to the guys that were from further south. And it's, it's listen, it's not taken away from their football ability or anything, but they, they just seem to play a more attacking style, obviously, all the time in the south and, and felt that they were happy in their own ability to be able to mark from the front. But sometimes that's not always the best way to, to man mark anyone. And, um, I was always happy enough uh, with the preparation that the Ulster Championship gave me in, in, in I suppose, in preparation to go to heading down Jones's Road and heading to go towards Crook Park. 
Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I suppose, can you when you look back, like obviously seven hundred titles, it's it's it, it's an amazing achievement. And obviously, when you look when you look back to one All Ireland two thousand two, fantastic as well. So, you know, with this with the core group of players you had, you are seriously seriously strong. But I suppose when you look back, do you feel you could have maybe nicked on maybe two or three more All Irelands with the panel players you had, or were you kind of coming up against these serious Kerry Throne teams? Listen, um, like any. Like any team, you always come up against a crop of players that, you know, seem to be a stumbling block. And, you know, after 2002, certainly Kerry and Throne were a stumbling block for us. We managed to beat Throne in the Ulster final in 2005, all right. But when it came to the semi final, they, they got one over us. But it's a rare reason they got there that, you know, you have to respect as well. You know, you look at the last 10 years and Dublin have dominated the other end stage. But, um, Mayo really brought, brought Dublin on as well, and you know Mayo in in probably other decades would have won a couple of all our, That's just the, the reality of sport. That's the way it is. Um, you know rivalries bring each other on, but there's always one dominant force in those rivalries as well. Um, you know it's 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 really it's really quite difficult to, to look back and say yes we could have won more all Irelands, and I believe we definitely could have won more more all Irelands. Given the the circumstances that we we're in, probably the back door came in at the wrong time for that Armagh team. But at the end of the day, you know we went to an All Ireland final in two thousand and three, going through the back door as well. Um, for me, the one though the the one year that really slipped by that we lost out in was two thousand and five, and I'm not sore about it in any shape or form. You've got to respect what thrown done, and you you got to give them huge admiration and, and respect for kicking on the All Ireland final and beating Kerry. But that Arma team for me was better than two thousand and two, was better than two thousand and three, and was probably the best Arma team of all time. And um, the reason why I'm saying that is, uh, we we played in the National League game in Wexford in the opening day of the National League in two thousand and five, and and we were six points up at half time, and we ended up losing the game by six points. So there was a twelve point swing. And from that particular game until that All Ireland semi final that year, we went unbeaten. So we went 16 games unbeaten. We won the National League, first Armad team ever to win the National League, and we won the Ulster title. And then we went on to the All Ireland semi final. And unfortunately, we came up against uh, a Tyrone team that were probably that wee bit more hungrier in terms of you know the fact that we had beat them in the Ulster final. So they had that wee bit more appetite to kick on and win the game. But there wasn't much between the two teams in the All Ireland semi final, and they got the the rub of the green towards the end and got a free, and they kicked it over the bar, and they won the game and deserved to win the game because they were a point ahead at the end, and that's the reality of it. But we went sixteen games unbeaten. We could have quite have easily have won that All Ireland semi final as well, and who knows what may have happened in the All Ireland final. And that was the one year that I believe that we we let it slip, um, really from our grasp because that Armagh team was in my opinion, um, a much more rounded team than what we had before that. And the benefit of having the 2004 under-21 on players coming through after winning the North Ireland really added a lot of space to that team and a lot of youthness and freshness to it as well. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. And I suppose, uh, can, tell me about the heat of the battle as well, Steve. Like, at Crow Park, you're after, after referencing some great games against the likes of uh, Tyrone and Kerry and great teams dubs as well so the heat of the battle just when it's just getting like the tick and thunder off it all and Crow Park 82,000 fans going absolutely mad Stevie you're, you're at the peak of your powers no more enjoyable time than that and uh, that's listen that's what it's all about um, and you've got to go into it and, and embrace it as well and enjoy every moment of it but you've got to realise that there's a job to do when you when you hit the, the, the turf of Crow Park and I learned the hard way. Um, my debut in Crook Park, um, I had an absolute nightmare and I was taken off in the 2000 All-Ireland semi-final against Kerry. Mike McCarthy didn't give me a sniff of the ball that day. And I was more concerned about playing at Crook Park than about playing against Kerry. So it was that particular day and I took my eye off the ball. And I, I made a promise to myself that day that that was never ever going to happen to me again. And it never did. Um, I think that was the one and only time that I was ever taken off for our match. Uh, in my career after that so y y you've got to prepare yourself and, and the way I, I prepared myself was every night I went to train in, in Callum Bridge in Armagh 
you know, I was mentally preparing myself for the challenges ahead and and going to Crook Park um, surface again and and putting on the arm and putting in big performances and and ever from that moment, while the crowd play a massive impact on on any occasion and any big game, you know, for me, my full focus was on me against the man that was marking me and putting in a performance. And once I got my head around that. I always felt that I was able to perform at a much higher level and, and thankfully more times than not, that's what I've done. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And of course, guys, this podcast is sponsored by OrgoRetro.com. Check the website for all your retro gear needs and wants. And I suppose, Stevie, when you when you look back in it and you, you were kind of referencing there, like the crowds and 80-odd 80, 80 thousand people being at the games, but like, were you ever kind of distracted by the crowd? Like, were you just kind of so focused on the task in hand? Like, were you ever a man to kind of hear it? Like, were you so focused you just... Didn't listen to any of them, just got on with your own game. Yeah, um, listen, as I said, the, the first day I was impacted by the crowd, but after that, um, my, my attention uh, my attention to getting myself focused um, really was on, on the game in hand. And yes, there's no denying that you hear the crowd, you hear um, the shouts and the roars from the crowd, and it really does give you an uplifting especially when the game is, is in, in the last couple of minutes. But, you know, I really was a player that could deal with um, the big occasion and, and with the, the noise that, you know, it really spurred me on and, and allowed me to focus more on, on just representing our man playing at a, at a higher level. And, um, you know, there's no, no better feeling than running out on the crew park and hearing that roar for the first time of 82,000 people uh, cheering your team on. And that gives you a real lift. And that, I suppose, 10 to 15 seconds before you... As you're running over to get the team photograph done, and um, gives you that opportunity to embrace the crowd. But after that, there, then your full focus is on, um, you know, what you're there to do, which is to get a result first and foremost and put in a performance. And as I said, you know, you've got Andy McNulty hanging off you week in, week out in training sessions. Justin McNulty, Francie Bell, your boys you got who are tough, tenacious uh, defenders, hanging off you week in, week out. There's no better preparation than going in to face the, the battle and, and done coming up against those boys on the Tuesday and Thursday night regularly. So, um, you know, in te- terms of being well schooled for, for championship football, I got it. Yeah, yeah, without a shadow of doubt, no better men to learn from and uh, work against. And I have to ask you, with 2003, I'd be regularly talking to uh, the great Conor Gormley and uh, he got back, he blocked. Could you really believe it? Like, like I think when you look back and that footage has been uh, shown a lot, like it was just, what was your thoughts at that time? And when you look back on it, just, it was uh, just an incredible moment for Tyrone. But could you believe he got back at you? Yeah, listen, um, first and foremost, you have to give him massive, massive credit. You know, if that was Enda McNulty making that block or Francie Bailey making that block, you know, I would be applauding him um, because that's what you want your defender to do. Um, it was it was a block that has certainly gone down in, in the history of the GA as one of the most important blocks of all time. Unfortunately, I was the one on the receiving end of it. But um, from my point of view, I give Connor huge credit. You know, it's a moment that I don't reflect too much on. Yes, it was a massive moment in, in, in a big game. But Connor, more, and I always say, if I had have seen him. In the corner of my eye at all, I would have tried to check inside and possibly he might have been forced to put me down, which might have, um, we might have been awarded a penalty. But to make a diving block from behind me, from out of nowhere, definitely was a shock to me at that particular time. But it was a moment where you just have to say, you know, from a throne point of view and, and from Conor Gormley's point of view, massive, massive respect to him because that's what you, you got to put your body on the line and those really defining moments and that was one of those uh, moments and that was the moment that got thrown over the line ultimately um, you know it wasn't a game where Armagh performed anywhere near their highest levels but we were always in the game and if that opportunity had have hit the back of the net then maybe the impetus might have been with us going into the damn moments of that game and we might have been able to kick on particularly given the fact that we were the current all Ireland champions. Yeah, and of course, Stevie, he has tagged on your last Ultra Championship well, um, for Armad. The last time the one was uh, 2008, and you took from Anna to a replay down in Clonus. And I suppose it, it, no, it, was, it, was, it was great to get it over the line. I think you know, I, I remember watching the two games and two fantastic games of football, and for Anna really came out of nowhere. I think Sean Doherty, the first day, kicked the equalising score. So, bacon hot day in Clonus, and uh, not a bad day at the office for yourself on both occasions. Yeah, um, 
yeah, two good days out of the office actually. And um, as you said, it was a bacon hot day in Clonus, and there's no better occasion um, than playing in, in, you know, an Ulster final in a packed house in, in St. Tiernix Park and, and the sun shining down. Yeah, it's, it's a special occasion for any player. And um, yes, uh, the first day in particular, I, I myself was on the receiving end of a lot of abuse from the Fermanagh goalkeeper. <laughs> but listen, at the end of the day, you know, uh, a lot of the time I use that type of um, negativity towards me to, to spur me on. And I, I think I scored maybe five or six points that day. I'm not too sure. But I, I remember some of his own teammates telling him to shut the fuck up, basically, because it, it was <laughs> also, um, I was happy enough with, with my, my outing, you know, as, as a popular Sometimes you have to be selfish and you have to, particularly as, as a forward, you have to say, right, my, my priority here is to get my own performance right. But ultimately, if my performance is right, it might lead to the team um, having a successful day at the office. And thankfully, my performance was right that day and led us getting getting a draw and, and having a second chance. And the second day out, I ended up scoring a point, a goal and a couple of points. And the goal was really the, the nail in the coffin for, for Mana because it came at a crucial stage where... And time was running out, and it really spurred us on the second half to kick on and win. Um, as I said, our seventh Ulster title in ten years. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I suppose talk to me about two thousand eight as well, because we we had a very good year for Pope Loxy to win the All Ireland that year. But Wex Wex were really becoming good. A lot of dark horses, even for Man to get to an Ulster, an Ulster um, final. And I think we played you in the first round that year. I think he's better than yeah. Breffney. But yeah, so like a lot of dark horses that year, Stevie. So um, yeah, like an enjoyable year, an enjoyable year for yourselves. Yeah, listen, any year that you, you taste success and you, you, you take home silverware is always a good year. But, you know, I I, I knew at that time that that Armagh team were coming towards the end um, of, of having a real good opportunity of going to our North Iron final and um, I felt that we missed the boat in, in the game against Waxford and um, we got off to a great start. I remember myself and Ronan Clark particularly got off to a great start with any balls that were coming into us and um, next thing was we reverted back and, and let slip a, a, a lead that um, we could have kicked on and, and, and made a massive difference in, in the second half but Wexford had some fantastic players as well. They had Maddie Ford, obviously, who's the standout player, but the PJ Banville, the Kieran Ling, players who were coming into their own at that particular time and could really turn the game upside down. And they gave us our fill of it in the second half. And, and the goal that Maddie got was, I suppose, um, the opportunity that they, they created for and, and waited for. And um, ultimately, it was the goal that knocked us out of the championship. And if we had have got across the line that particular day, we would have been faced with Throne again in the All Ireland semi final. And given the rivalry, even though I felt Throne were a much better team than us at that particular time in 2008, um, you know we we may have been able to pick ourselves up and, and get ourselves up for the for the fight and for the battle um, in the semi final. And who knows where it would have led to, but. You know, once again, you know, Throne's remarkable campaign of 2008 was um, simply spectacular, which finished off with them winning their third All-Ireland. But, um, you know, they had many scores along the way as well. Um, I think Wexford gave them a uh, cause for concern in the All-Ireland semi-final as well. And um, they may... Uh, uh, who was it that knocked them out of um, Ulster? Was it Down maybe knocked them out of Ulster as well that particular year? Um, oh, so yeah, a replay, yeah. So, you know, they had their own scares given given the circumstances and maybe the fact that uh, Down had beat them in the replay um, gave them an opportunity to rebuild and, and, and get themselves back in order and unfortunately, being also the champions and going out the next day, we didn't have that opportunity of a second chance, but that's that's part and parcel of, of the system and, and how it was played out. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I suppose 2008, um, it, it, it gives me good memories because uh, my uncle, Sean, he was, so, he was the uh, chairman of the Ulster GA Writers and he would have presented you a monthly award in Christ. I must, I don't know what age, age it was. I think you were getting, you were signing stuff for me. So all the kind of personal accolades over the years, Stevie, uh, not bad to get. No, not bad. Listen, it's always nice to get personal accolades, but um, ultimately you never receive personal accolades without the help of your teammates and, and the guidance of your management team as well. And um, I always put all of those accolades down to help and support that. You know, ultimately, 
you know, my responsibility in the team was to try to get as many scores for the team to make sure that there was success. But those scores would never come without the long direct delivery from the likes of John McEntee, Paul McGrain, Kieran McGinney, Aidan O'Rourke, players you got there that supported us attackers um, really well and gave us the opportunity and the platform to, I suppose, present our skills as best we possibly could. So, um, you know, personal accolades come and go, but, um, you know, there, there was many picked up during, during the course of the my career, but ultimately, you know, it was my teammates that led to those successes. Yeah, definitely, without a shadow of a doubt. And I suppose after 2008, um, do you feel like maybe a lot of players maybe dropped off, but obviously you retired in uh, 2011, so you obviously didn't win any Ulsters after that, Stevie. So what do you think maybe was the problem after that? Like, I know Tyrone and Monaghan were probably starting to come good, and Donegal as well, of course, but what do you feel maybe after 2008 was the story, obviously before you retired as well, was the story not getting Ulster finals and maybe the latter end of the All-Ireland? Yeah, I, I really believe that... Um, in 2010, we might have been able to get to an Ulster final. Uh, I thought there was a good team. There was a place of a good team building again. It was Paddy O'Rourke's first year. And unfortunately, we went out and failed to put in a performance in the Ulster semi-final against Derry. And they really, really tore us apart that particular day. Um, oh, sorry, that was 2011 I'm talking about. Uh, and that was an opportunity missed by us. But in, in reality, you know, and um, without disrespecting the players that have been wearing the Armagh jersey over the last decade, I don't think that you know, overall they're at the level that we were at. And it's no disrespect to those players, as I said. You know, we were very fortunate that there was a massive, massive uh, committed and talented group of players came along at the one time. And sometimes you get that with teams. But, you know, over the last couple of seasons, Armagh have definitely improved and built upon... Um, you know, talent of players coming through and there is an opportunity for them in, in the campaigns ahead but that opportunity will only come if they learn from playing against the Division 1 teams and have that chance coming up hopefully in the league campaign and they can learn from that there and hopefully improve again and continue on their pathway to development but looking at um, the progress that the likes of Cavan made last year has to be a massive, massive boost for the likes of Arma as well and has to give them a real impetus to kick on and, and to improve and get back to competing in Ulster finals again as well. And when you look at the how Cavan played in the Ulster final against Donegal, they really they showed them no respect and they got, got into their face and, and you know, with that there and with the quality players that Cavan had, you know, the one out and, and deserved the win out and they showed probably Arma because Arma maybe showed a wee bit too much respect to Donegal in the, in the Ulster semi-final last year and stood off them a wee bit much. And, you know, when you do that to any team who have a team full of good players, you'll be dominated. And Calvin just didn't show Donegal the same respect and ultimately ended up winning the game. And that's what you have to be. That's where you got to be at as a team. And that's, if you show a team too much respect, they'll walk all over you. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested kind of, to hear your perspective on that, Stevie. Obviously, last year, the uh, semi final, uh, the, yeah, the semi final against uh, Donny Gall, and I think we've seen pictures of the Gaden Forker and uh, pictures like that kind of like, shouting in Murphy's face. And I think Armagh were maybe losing the game with seven or eight points. If you were the Armagh manager, Stevie, I don't know, what would your mindset be on that? Because I think, well, my mindset is, it is if you're winning, maybe do that. But if you're losing, would it not be better to be run up the pitch and support the play? Or what, what's your mindset and all that? Listen, players that have such have, have had such an impact in Gaelic games like Michael Murphy will always have player other players trying to get inside their head. The reality is, it doesn't work with a player like Michael Murphy. You know, he's been around the block and he's seen all of that um, down through the years, and um, he's been probably the most influential player of the last decade in terms of of Gaelic games overall. Um, so, you know, in reality, when you're, particularly when you're losing, you know, focus your attention on your own game. Um, never mind trying to get inside the head of somebody else's. Uh, and, you know, if you're, if you're more concentrating on your own game and trying to perform at a higher level, then the reality is you probably play at a better level as well. And I'm not particularly a fan of it. You know, it happened to me often enough down through the years where, players were trying to intimidate me and get inside my head. But in reality, you know, I bounced off that there. I, I love that. And, you know, 
any player worth their salt, any attacking player worth their salt will, all, will always bounce off that. There are some players that can allow that to impact them and affect them, but you know, there are not too many. Uh, you know, when you come to the marquee footballers nowadays, you know, if somebody's trying to get inside their head, they'll just laugh that off. What I would say is, um, you know, and hopefully RMA will have learned it, is I, I do believe that the show done got far, far too much respect in terms of, um, you know, standing off them and allowing them an opportunity to turn them and create those moments where they punished RMA heavily in terms of getting their goals last year. You know, you have to be in the face of a team that can clinically punish you. And Cavan done that in the Ulster final, and that was the reason why Cavan came out on top, because they showed very little respect towards Donegal and they showed that they were capable of playing football as well. And when you have that, um, I suppose, impact and forcefulness in, in any particular game, then you can come out and be successful. And Armagh just lacked a wee bit of, um, I suppose, it's it's hard to put put it in, into one particular word, but I just thought that it stood stood off only all too much, and hopefully they will have learned from that um, mistake last year, because you know we as our mass supporters always believe that talent ways to have equally as much talent but when a team is tasting success as much as Donegal have tasted in the last 10 years then you, you can't show them respect you have to try to um, enforce your own game onto them and that's by getting stuck into them yeah, definitely, definitely. And I suppose 2011 came calling, Stevie, and uh, it was your final year with the Armagh Senior Footballers. Uh, what was the reason behind the retirement, or did you just feel like you had had enough at that stage? Um, no, uh, believe it or not, I, I had a good campaign for Armagh in 2011, and my last championship game ended up with me scoring eight points against their own. So, um, you know, if you're still capable of scoring eight points against a team that's competing at that level, then it's it's shown me and proven to me that um, you're still able to perform at that level. I always did say that I would retire on my own terms and I didn't want to be a player that hung around the scene too long and probably um, be forgotten about in terms of the good years that I had represented our man. Um, but, you know, I, I always wanted to give the club a couple of decent years um, when I was still capable of playing a good level of that played in my mind over the winter months. I went to Australia after that game against Throne and, and represented Ireland. And um, it was probably, you know, in all of the campaigns I represented Ireland in the Aussie rules, that was probably the one campaign that I, that, I, that I was probably the one that I performed at a much higher level. You know, everything that I did done over the course of the two games um, seemed to pay, pay off for me. and. You know, if I kicked for a point, I went over the bar. If I made a, went to go make a mark, I made the mark. If I went to make the pass, it was successful. And I don't think there was anything over the two games that I'd done wrong. So that, once again, proved to me that I was still capable of playing at a, at a much higher level. Um, but um, the club had a, a group of young players coming up through the ranks that could challenge in terms of we were at, at intermediate level at that particular time and I felt that there was an intermediate championship in the club, in the team and we got a new management team in place as well and um, you know with that there it gave me a huge drive to to stay involved with the, with the club team. I, Paddy O'Rourke was the Armand manager at the time, he met me on numerous occasions, he assured me that I would still be the Armagh captain if I uh, wish to return, but he wanted me to take a few months off um, to really think about my career and my future. Um, and that's what i done. I got involved with, play, with pre-season training at the club. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, and in April 2012, I think it was, I ended up um, making the decision that I was going to retire from county football. So for me, I could have certainly played county, county football in 2012 and captain Dharma and got on the team. Um, would my performance levels have been as high? I'm not too sure, but my performance levels that particular year for the club were at a very high level as well, and I was happy where I was at. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So we, we touched at the start, uh, you represented Ireland uh, numerous times in international rules, and you captained them in 2010, as you were um, alluding to as well. So uh, proud moments for yourself, Steve, and uh, obviously what, what did you make of the whole uh, international rules experience yourself? Yeah, I loved it. Um, I, I loved the way the game was played back then, particularly in the earlier years when I played it. 
there was that competitive nature to it. There was full houses in Crow Park. We paid we paid Australia in Crow Park in two thousand six, and I seen uh, footage of it just recently. And the Hogan Stand and Canal End and Hill Sixteen, they're all full. You know, so you're talking about sixty plus thousand uh, supporters uh, going to watch these games. So you know, as as a footballer, I I love playing it. I love putting myself against professional players and seeing where where I was at. And I love the opportunity to play with um, the best players in the country as well. The likes of um, Kieran Donaghy, Benny Calder, you know, Finney and Hanley at the time, Park Joyce, all top class players, all winners in the right and very successful players for for their own counties. But the opportunity to pull on the Irish jersey gave me that chance to make friendships uh, throughout the country, but to also play alongside those top class players that you were pitting your wits out. Against a week in week out in in the inter county game, so um, it was a great chance to to see and to learn from other players as well. And listen, as a game and as a concept back then, I definitely loved it. As a concept in more recent years, um, I fall a wee bit out of love with it because of how the Australians have approached the game. But I don't think Ireland have ever taken their eye off the ball in terms of the type of teams that they've um, sent towards it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I suppose what can, as you were saying, what can have you made of the product of the last couple of years? Because obviously, when you were playing in it, there was ferocious battles in Crow Park, and we can always remember them. And obviously, we we have a great success. Obviously, you captain captain us in two thousand and ten. So, what have you made of it in the last couple of years? Like I know there's calls for it to be scrapped, there's calls for it to be enhanced, promoted better. So, what have you made of it all, Stevie, in the last years? Yeah, listen. Um, when you're playing against professional players, um, obviously. There's a good high level of skill involved with them all anyway, but you want to be playing against the big game players. That's the reason why you participate and play. You want to be playing against um, the players who are representing their teams week in, week out, Aussie rules and performing at a high level. And fortunately, um, some of those players haven't been made available over the last couple of seasons and um, are over the last couple of uh, rules tests. And that's disappointing from a player's point of view because that's where you really get the, your your awards from um, is playing against the best of the best. Where do I see the game? What I would love to see happen to the game is actually a couple of um, years that is brought to America and played out in America. I think it gives the Irish fan base in America an opportunity to see uh, players from their own counties playing the game um, that's a wee bit different. It gives the Australian fan base in America an opportunity to see um, their own heroes playing uh, in a game is a wee bit different and I really believe that it would attract a huge crowd over in, over in the States. You know, if a game was played in the East Coast and then the following test in the West Coast, something like that there, um, I think it would generate a lot of interest in uh, once again and we get the crowds back watching the games and there would be an incentive there once again. You know, we have to remember as well, the cup is named after the late great Cormac McAnallen as well and we can't lose sight of that. You know, I played alongside Cormac um, in my first year of, of representing Ireland and you know you you don't you want Cormac's legacy to live on and you want the, the opportunity to to play and represent your country and to play for the Cormac McNall uh, Cup to win on or to live on as well and um, the only way for me of reigniting the spark in the series is by bringing it to uh, somewhere like uh, this, the America to to see how it develops over there. Yeah, yeah, definitely an interesting uh, topic on to discuss. And suppose your club, obviously your club, Calibi, it's, it's where it starts and finishes, says uh, Steve. And I know from you, Steve, from Calibi, it, it, it was always a special, special uh, club for you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, like, like anyone, um, you know, you, you always look back to, to where it all began. And for me, Calibi is everything. You know, my kids are now representing Calibi. And I love every opportunity that I get to, to go down to the pitch. I'm, I'm almost down around the football field every single day of the week. I live close enough to it. I take my dog into it for walks around it. You know, I'm down watching the kids play now, thankfully that they're back on the pitch. So, um, you know, your club is everything and you, you try to give as much back to it as, as you possibly can. And, um, you know, I have huge respect for all about my club and um, always will have. And hopefully my kids will grow up and get out of the club what I got out of it as well. And 
that's that's just the way it is. You know, it, it's the heartbeat of 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 Ireland is the GA clubs, and we all love with immense pride um, where we are from and, and the club that we represent. And I'm no different than anyone else. Um, unfortunately, my name rhymes with where I'm from, <laughs> and everyone, uh, you know, Clevey is synonymous with with my name. Obviously, land and breath of the country. So. Um, that's just uh, you know sometimes you, you're in Kerry or Stevie from Clevey people have never st- set foot in Clevey but they, they know it by, by simply by my name but that's just the way it is you know it's a, it's a place that um, I love dearly it's close to my heart and um, you know I'm looking forward to going back and watching games in the coming year in it, and there's no place like it and even having a pint or two in the clubhouse afterwards you know it was a bit of banter and a bit of slagging and good crack and it's a great place to be, and that's just the reality of it. It's you know, GA clubs, as I said, are the heartbeat of any any community and throughout, throughout the country. And um, I, I just love my club, and that's it. Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. And just if we touch briefly on the uh, three All Stars that you won, Stevie, um, how proud were you when you picked all them up? Because at the end of the day, it's the penultimate for every GA player. Yeah, listen, um, I suppose when you're talking about individual accolades. Um, there's none higher than uh, picking up an all star, and you know it, it probably gives you the inner belief that you are amongst the best group of players in the country. Um, and while I won three, I was nominated, I think, for six all stars. So over a period of seven or eight years, you know, I really believed that I was in the top three uh, forwards in the country. For that period, and um, that confidence and belief came from um, you know being given the honour of, of receiving all stars, but also um, from the teammates that I played alongside as well, and, and knowing that I could compete and come up against those boys and put in good performances um, on on a, on a weekly basis. But listen, winning all stars is a fantastic achievement, and um, if I had of end of my career winning one, I would have been immensely proud of of that. But winning three um, really showed me, uh, I suppose, how good that Armad team were as well. Because you know we were we were at the business end of the campaign year in year out for for the guts of a decade, and we I wouldn't have received any All Star awards without the support of my teammates. And put it all down to that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so to wrap up, Stephen, you played for a number of years, but when you look back, who would have been the best player you played with and against over the years? Uh, with and against, um, l- listen, I, I've been fortunate enough to play with many, many top-class players. You know, I represented Ulster, Ireland, Armagh, Clevey, um, and many, many top-class players. But the players um, that jump out my mind um, are always... You know, for for leadership and guidance and inspirational, Pierre McGinney um, has to stand out. Uh, you know, he was the inspirational captain. He was the driving force behind a, a fantastic Armagh team that I played on, and he was just a, a top class player um, to play alongside. Paul McGrain was of um, similar ilk to to Kieran and a driving force, um, a, a massive influence around the middle sector of the field for Armagh, and a player who probably set me up with a large amount of my scores. But um, you know those two players are certainly top of my list. But Ashley McConville is certainly another player. You know when the chips are down and when you need somebody to produce something spectacular and get a score, they keep uh, the ball and keep keep you as boys the ball rolling for the for the team. And then Ashley come up with the goods time after time. And to have a player with the mental capacity that he had um, was second to none. So, you know, those are a couple of players that were spectacular. But as I said, listen, um, I played alongside the likes of Stephen Cluxon, you know, probably the greatest GA goalkeeper of all time. Um, fantastic player. I played alongside Andy Lynch from from Cork, brilliant uh, cornerback. Uh, Kieran Donaghy, a top class full forward, Park Jace, you know, the name, the, the list is endless really. And But those three players, players that I soldiered with um, long and often enough and I, I know exactly uh, what they brought to any occasion and they were fantastic players to play alongside. Yeah and against, were they the kind of players you, the best players you played against? Um, played against, uh, listen I, I, I go back to what my point I made earlier on, um, I always felt that players that I played against that marked me um, 
and that were better at doing that were, were for Ulster and therefore the likes of Ryan McManaman was always a tough tenacious uh, tackler and, and a really good um, man to man marker um, Kevin McGuckin from Derry was a fantastic man to man marker Sean Marty Lockhart another one brilliant man to man markers but uh, probably overall you know when you weigh up um, the collective and when I first came into the scene in 2000-2001 Seamus Moynihan was something spectacular back then and he was a fantastic player for Kerry down through the years and he was one of the most difficult opponents um, that, you know, as a team we faced against. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, Stephen McDonald. Retro gear knees. Stephen, that was an absolute pleasure. Thanks a million for joining me and uh, look after yourself. No problem. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Cheers, Stephen. Thank you. Okay, bye.